Hello, my friends. My name is Henry, and uh, we're going to take a look at uh, Daggerheart. Uh, this little video has Matthew and Spencer kind of going through the rules. I'm super excited to see what they've come up with. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me before we get started. Uh, I'm, an, I'm a solo indie game developer. I've been an indie developer for about four years, and I, and I work on tabletop games, card games, uh, tabletop RPGs, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping to kind of uh, give my own game designer perspective to a lot of what they're going to be talking about. So yeah, let's get started. Hey everybody, my name is Matthew Mercer. And I'm Spencer Stark. And we are inviting you here, this video, to learn how to play Daggerheart, a new RPG that is currently in development. So before we get into the basics, we just want to remind all of you that this game is now currently in open beta. So things discussed in this video may change, shift, go away, be added to, and that's part of the process of making a game. Indeed. To learn more and even join our open beta playtest, go check out daggerheart.com. So dive in, break the game, tell us what works, what doesn't work, what you love about it, what you hope to see added, and tell us all that through the official Daggerheart open beta surveys. The more people who play the game, the better we can make it. So jump in and help us break this thing because we are so excited to build this game with you and not just for you. So please play often and submit those surveys so we know what you like and what you don't. Hell yeah. Okay, so a uh, tiny little thing before we get started. Uh, yes, if you are at all interested in this game, go play it. The best thing you can do um, to help game development of any kind is to participate in stuff like this like go out play the game and with your experience and and everything like that tell them how you feel about it tell them what you hate tell them what you like because as a game developer uh there is nothing better than someone who understands your system because they've played it or someone who's played it or read it and experienced it telling you what's wrong with it because us game de designers we can kind of get lost in our own loop um and that feedback is vital for development so if you want this game to be good or at least the best game that it can be you should go out and play it so yeah full full send on that so Daggerheart is a fantasy tabletop role-playing game that sort of blends the narrative and the like crunchy together. Yeah, I like that. It, really, it helps facilitate gameplay that is both uh, theater of mind, if that's your preference, but also easy enough to also play it more tactically and to use maps and minis like I love to do with our sessions. The game doesn't really stop down when you're doing combat. You just kind of continue to play the way you do throughout the entire rest of the game. And so everything flows in and out of itself, so it allows you to really focus on the story that you all are telling. Okay, um, so they're talking about marrying narrative, role play, and theater of the mind with crunchy numbers and, like, tabletop tactics, right? Like a board game. Um, that's very interesting because usually those things don't mix. Not that they can't mix, but it's, in my own experience, it has been, it's very difficult to and like incentivize role playing from game mechanics or um turn role playing into game mechanics and stuff like that it, it's usually sometimes they can be at, at odds each other it's really easy to make a game mechanic that says when you do this do that or if you spend this you do that um so i'm curious to see how they do that and besides like flavor you know flavor is kind of just dressing up the game mechanic in a way that sounds narrative you know um but it's not really the same so i'm wondering how they accomplish that um they also talk about it being you can play theater of the mind or tactical now in my experience if you want to play theater of the mind, you can play, you can make the game work for theater of the mind. Um, it's a lot more difficult to do the opposite where take something that 
isn't really um isn't really mechanically heavy and trying to make rules up for it so that you can play on like a hex grid or something like that you know um at least that's my personal opinion but you know people have played fifth edition or other versions of D D without maps even though in my personal opinion they shouldn't do that because it's a dungeon crawling game it's meant to be i mean gary gygax made dungeons that's why you're called a dungeon master is because you are supposed to have it's kind of it's supposed to be set up like a board game um the role play is like added on top at a benefit but um i'm curious as to how they handle this because very interesting deeply customizable character creation and development process throughout the, the mechanics of the game it is a long-term campaign game so it runs over the course of 10 levels which gives you plenty of uh, fodder to be able to play a year-long campaign with if that is something that you want but could also jump in and play a one-shot or a couple of sessions and so 10 levels over a year is in my experience pretty similar to Fifth edition. Um, so I assume you will be leveling up as often as you would have done. Um, I wonder if they'll do XP. I really like XP. Uh, for multiple reasons, but um, yeah, I would I would say ten levels over a year should be appropriate if you are going for the same sort of pace as a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. Uh, works just as well for that. Yeah. One of the things you can really expect from Daggerheart is a game that gives you tools, if you want to use them, to rapidly create in-depth characters that have dynamic relationships with the other players and characters at the table, as well as an opportunity and tools for the GM and the players to build a world mm -hmm. together. You can, you can make and play or run a game as deep or as shallow mm -hmm. or as simple or as robust as you want to. And the intent of Daggerheart is to give you all those tools at your disposal and teach you how to implement them in your game. So you can kind of pick and choose what it is you enjoy about this or run the full gamut and go all in. Now let's get into the basics. Okay, so before we get into the basics, um, basically what I'm hearing is that there's lots of optional roles. So Matthew is talking about how there's lots of different things that you can add to your game and make it as simple as possible or as complex as possible. And what that basically says is, hey, there's lots of optional rules in here and you can customize your experience, which I'm a huge fan of. Um, not every table is going to be the same and it shouldn't be. Um, every friend group or table is going to want something different out of the game than a different table. So I... I really like the idea of optional rules. It's great. It keeps things fresh. It makes it so that um, you can kind of play however you want. And there's already rules that have been, ideally, uh, rules that have already been tested that you can try out and see if that experience would be better. Um, so yeah, those, those are good. I just hope that when they have these optional rules, they correctly display them and invite the players to use them. Because what... Dungeons and Dragons fails to do is kind of present those optional rules because a lot of people will be like, hey, did you know that this optional rule exists? It's just that the game hides it. You know, it's hidden in this like back of the book section that's just optional rules that no player ever gets to read. So I hope I hope that they display these optional rules and make it so that it's more inviting to use them. So, yeah, that sounds great so far. Of Daggerheart. Duality dice are sort of the bread and butter for Daggerheart. They consist of two different colored 12-sided die, your hope die and your fear die. Now, you choose which is which, and for us, we're using these, this brighter colored one as our hope die and this kind of darker red colored one as our fear die. Anytime your team asks you to make an action roll, you'll roll both your hope die and your fear die. And you add them together along with any relevant modifiers represented by little tokens like this. Yeah, the tokens can also be coins or yeah. beads, or you can just do the math in your head, but it helps to have these little representations right there next to the dice you rolled to do the quick math. 
Then you tell the GM your results, along with whether your hope die or your fear die. I don't understand the token part, but... Is that to help differentiate which one is which? I don't know. I don't understand that part. Dies roll highest. For example, let's say Travis is playing Bertrand Bell and is making an agility roll. He has a plus one to his agility trait, uh, and he ends up rolling a nine on his hope die and a four on his fear die, plus the one. He'd add all that together and then tell the GM that he got a 14 with hope. Yeah, not good. 14 mm -hmm. meets or beats the difficulty decided by the GM. He succeeds on his agility roll, and he also gains one hope, rolling with hope. Every okay, a uh, couple things. So, they're using D12s, which I find interesting. And they're doing 2, 2D12 and adding them together. Um, my game does something similar. I've developed, uh, I'm developing a game that does something similar. Um, I used D10s, 2D10, instead of D12s. Um, it's, just, it's interesting that they're going with D12s because it means that the total roll that you can achieve although very difficult, um, is a 24, which is a lot higher than a 20 that you could get with the D20 from Dungeons and & Dragons. And I'm drawing a lot of comparison to Dungeons & Dragons because Critical Role has been playing D&D for, like, freaking a million years. Um, so, yeah. Um... It's very interesting because that means that also that the average roll that you would get is a lot a lot higher um the average roll of a d20 is about 10.5 so round it up it's 11 and then the average roll of 2d12 would be 6.5 plus 6.5 which is 13 so yeah you about have not only is your average roll up by two you can't roll a one the lowest you can roll is a 2. And the highest you can roll is a 24 versus a 20. So on average, not only on average, but also at maximum, your dice results are going to be higher than if you play d and I'm curious to know what the difficulty scores are going to be and what a player character is going to add to their roll. Because if they want to be within the same realm of possibility as Dungeons and Dragons with their difficulty scores then but they want to keep this dice that means that the player's power would be lower because they have to reduce how many modifiers they have or the strength of those modifiers to kind of compensate how much power is coming from the dice now, I personally don't like that direction. I, as a player, like to feel like I have some sort of agency. Now, the 2d12 actually helps with that a little bit, as opposed to a d20. And the reason why is because um, the way that two dice work and adding them together versus one die is um, the probability of a d20 or a single die is really flat, right? each result is equally possible as the next one. Whereas two dice together, it ends up being more like a pyramid. So your maximum roll is really hard to get. And the minimum roll, or, or the minimum roll is also really hard to get. And then the middle, in the middle, it's actually really easy. So on average, more often than not, by quite a bit, actually, you will be getting about the average, things close to the middle, um, which is good. I personally like that. I went in that direction because um, I don't. the D20 is very random. Because everything is equally chance, um, it's, you know, your character can feel very good and very bad, it's, you know, and, and almost right after in each other. You can roll a 5 and then you can roll a 17 very easily because those are equally chanced to appear whereas something like 2d10 or 2d12 it's actually really hard to kind of give you an idea rolling a natural 20 is a five percent chance rolling two tens on 2d10 is a one percent chance so you will roll five natural 20s before you roll two tens um so yeah and 
also because there's uh, more faces on a D12 than a D10, that chance will actually be even lower. So the maximum chance or the maximum result that you will get is even lower than 1%. So not that it's not impossible, obviously. It's just that that's the likelihood of it happening. So, which I am a fan of. I'm not a fan of the fact that it's 2d12 because that means it can go all the way up to 24. And that's something that you have to account for as a game designer is even though it's less than a 1% chance of happening, it's still something you have, you have to think about because it can happen. If it can happen, it will. And even though it's likelihood is less than 1%, that doesn't mean that your ability to roll 2d, you know, two twelves is in, is, you know, perceivably that possible. As someone who has play tested two dice and adding them together, um, you can start to roll really high more often than you would think. You know, the math says one thing, but your experience will say something else. So, um, that's interesting. There was something else. I'm gonna go back a little bit. There was something else that. Fourteen meets or beats the difficulty decided by the GM. That's what it was. The difficulty decided by the GM. Uh, me personally, I kind of hate this. Um, it really depends on how the GM is going to decide the, the the difficulty. Is it played out in the book? Like, hey, you should pick this number. You know, like, is the task they're doing easy? Here you go. This is the number. If it's like that, if it's like the GM is deciding how hard something is and then how hard something is results in the book telling you what the the score should be then it's like kind of like how fifth edition does it then that's fine right if you go rules is written dungeons and dragons where you know it's 5 10 15 20 25 30 that's fantastic um that difficulty score system is great because it's static it means that the players have an expectation of how difficult something should be and um the there's no goalpost moving right the gm doesn't say like ooh, you know if only you rolled an 18 you know some weird out of pocket number and me personally as a when i gm i find it very difficult to kind of just pull a number out of my ass right so i'm not a fan of the gm deciding how difficult something is at least what the number is um i'm a huge fan of clarity where the GM or the game tells the player, hey, you need this to beat. You need to beat this. And that number is clear and represented to the player. And then the player has to roll, and they understand before even rolling whether or not they will succeed or fail, and they understand the risk that will go into it, and they can decide to spend resources in order to, in order to beat it, you know? I don't like hiding stuff behind the curtain from the player. I think that's unfair. And it kind of can produce, like, cheater fudge behavior from the GM, which is, you know, sometimes it's good if your GM is good, you know, if pure of heart and wants to make a great story, you know, but some, but, you know, I'm personally not a fan of that. Uh, I used to do a lot of fudging and now I don't. I, I don't like it anymore. Um... Because, you know, I think it's unfair to the players. You know, if I want them, if they win, they win. You know, the dice, if we're going to roll with dice, but we're going to change the results behind the screen or something like that, then there isn't really a point, you know. And this is why I personally think that CRPGs like Baldur's Gate 3 or Pillars of Eternity or something like that um, is better at GMing than most GMs because of that communication with the player. Um, so I'm hoping that when they say the GM decides the difficulty score, I really hope it's not just pick a number because that's not really fair to anybody. Um, we'll see. We'll see. In my, in my game, I have a static difficulty um, like Dungeons and Dragons. So... If you want to go for that, which I personally like a lot because it means that there's something that is unachievable to you at level one 
but then becomes more achievable to you as you level up, which is great. And then I have a second type of difficulty, which is scaling, which basically the GM says, what level are you? This is a medium encounter. Okay, uh, let me look at this table here. 17, you gotta beat a 17. Um, I've played with scaling difficulty a lot. It's super fun, it's super great. And the reason why I made it that way is because I freaking hate just picking a number. Like the, the GM, you know, pick a number. The GM should just pick a number, you know, and I don't like it. I don't like being on the spot just picking a number and I, I never feel confident in the number that I do pick um, and because it feels like I should just, at that point, it feels like I should just roll a die to decide what the difficulties should be and that's not fun to me. To me, it's not fun and it's not fair. So, but anyways. He succeeds on his agility roll and he also gains one hope rolling with hope. Every time your hope die is higher, you gain a hope, which is a liquid resource your character can spend to aid allies or activate special abilities. Now, sometimes your character might have an experience that you could further modify an action roll in their favor. Like maybe your character has a haggler as an experience when trying to negotiate with a shopkeeper or uh, expert herbalist mm -hmm. when looking for medicinal plants in the vicinity. So you can spend a hope before the roll and describe how that experience helps you and then add its value to your roll. You add it all up, and if it meets or beats the difficulty score, you succeed. But your hope and fear die influence what happens next. Indeed, if you succeed with hope, you get what you want, and you gain one hope. Mm -hmm. You can spend that later on. But if you succeed and roll with fear, you get what you want, but it may come with a consequence or add a complication. Mm -hmm. Additionally, the GM takes a fear token, a liquid resource that the GM can use to affect the story both in and out of combat, but we'll cover that later. If you... Okay. In and out of combat. That's interesting. Interesting that the GM, the arbiter of all things, gets a resource. That's interesting and kind of cool. I'm very interested in what you can do with these tokens, because that'll dictate a lot of stuff. Um, because... It also depends on a, a couple things. So basically, depending on how many... So whenever a any player rolls higher with fear, the GM gets something, which is kind of like a difficulty adjuster for when you have a large party, like what Matthew Mercer typically plays with, you know, like seven, sometimes eight players, which is ridiculous, by the way. That's like twice as many as you should be playing with, but he manages to do it. Um... But if all seven of those, seven or eight of those players are giving, feeding him fear tokens, that can kind of balance out the game in the GM's favor so that even though he's so vastly outnumbered, you know, it can kind of even things out. So I like that idea, but again, it kind of depends on what he can do with those fear tokens. If it's super strong, then it's like, oh, I don't know. You know, does one fear token equal one thing that they can do? Is, is there, like, a scale? Is it kind of like Call of Duty where, like, oh, I have a two-kill streak. What can I get with a two-kill streak? Or, hey, I have 15 of these things. What can I spend with these 15 things? Is it going to be like that? Who knows? Um, the player getting a hope token is interesting. It, it also very, very, very much depends on what they can do with hope. And can they share them? If the players can share hope, then it kind of defeats the purpose of the GM getting them. Um, at least in my opinion, because... I feel like conceptually, you know, I'm, I haven't looked into the game at all. I don't know what you can do with these things. But if the player characters can share the hope tokens, that's dangerous. Or potentially, anyway. In, in a way that where, like, you have five, six, seven people who can also all roll hope and, add the, and you know, uh, spend them to help each other, give them to each other. And, like, as much as a cool idea of that is, of, like, hey, let's collaborate, uh, I fear what that would entail for the game, you know? Maybe it's a not super dangerous thing. Again, it all depends on what they can use these tokens for. Um, so we'll have to see. We'll have to see on that. If you fail with hope, you don't get what you want and will likely face consequences, but you still gain a hope. If you fail with fear, you don't get what you want, and you may suffer major consequences. Additionally, um, so this idea of 
uh, like narrative dice, dice having narrative weight besides the idea of succeeding or failing. Like you succeed, but something bad happens, but and you fail, but something good happens. That's not new. Um, the Warhammer RPG does this. The unofficial Elder Scrolls RPG does this. Um, there's degrees of success. There's narrative dice. There's lots of different, th uh, tons of games have done stuff like this before. I like this direction though. It's very simple. You don't have to have custom dice. Um, you don't have to count very much at all. You don't have to do extra math. It's just which one's higher. So that's good. I like that. I think that accomplishes what those other games try to do, but in a much simpler form. Um, so that's great. Um, I hope they do something good with this. Um, I don't, I mean, like, I've tried to do something like that in my game, and, like, I don't know, it, it, it didn't really work for me. Um, maybe it's just because of the, the, game, the tables that I play with or that I've playtested with, um, but... I'm also curious to say to see what what they mean by something good happens even though you fail. It's like what does that mean? Is there like a list? Is there like a table? Is there a list of things that you can get? Or is there like does the GM just have to make it up? I hope your GM's creative, you know? Like um like you succeed in unlocking the door, but you made a loud noise, so now they know where you are. Like, is it something like that because the GM just made it up? Or, like, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm fearful of stuff like that because sometimes the GM can create a scenario that is a lot more painful to the player than, than it should be. Uh, depending on what's going on, you know, like sometimes it's like, ooh, something bad happens. It's like, how do you measure a bad circumstance? Like, you know, how can you determine what's appropriate given the situation? Like, and sometimes cre creating those scenarios or coming up with scenarios like that can be very difficult. I'm very interested to see how they word that section in their book. Like, how do they explain what to do? Because you have to remember, this is a new game. And there are going to be lots of players that are going to come in to try out this game and they're not going to know what to do. Some of them, people who've never GM'd before. And I don't think that GMing, having previous GM experience, should be a requirement or a expectation of anyone that comes into any RPG. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, this is something that I would have to read. I'd have to read how they describe how this works. GM takes a fear token. Now, lastly, if you roll doubles on the two dice, you get a critical success, which means you get exactly what you want. You gain a hope, you clear a stress, and possibly some other cool benefits alongside it. Okay. Um, critical success on rolling doubles. So my games does something similar. I use 2d10. I don't use 2d12. Um, and we'll get into I'll get into why that's important later, but um, so they say it's critical success. That means I assume it means that it's of the same sort of power as a D, as rolling a natural twenty. Um, I used to do that and I changed it because I didn't like it. It was way too powerful, specifically because of how expertise works in my game and advantage works in my game um they basically increased your chances of rolling doubles so i had to change it i made it so that it wasn't a critical success i made it so it was just hey you roll doubles but you still have to succeed against the challenge score or you still have to hit their armor defense or something like that um because with with 2d10 your chance of rolling two of the same number is 10%, which I will remind you, a natural 20 is a 5%. So you have twice as much chance to crit. And if you're going just blanket statement, if you roll doubles, you crit, that means you can't critically fail. So even rolling two ones is actually really good 
you know, especially in a game like this. Granted, as we've said before, rolling to the same number, um, you know, like two tens or two ones on 2d10 is a 1% chance, and rolling uh, that with d12s is even lower chance, you know, that's um, not super, it's not going to happen very often, but something to note, the difference between the 2d10 and the 2d12 is because there's more sides on the face, or, or there's no face, there's more uh, sides on the die, your chance to roll to the same number is actually harder than 2d10. So your chance to roll the same number is less than a percent each time, um, which means that it's less than 10% to get a crit, but it's more. It's going to be more than five. So my guess is like 8% or something like that chance to crit. Maybe it's closer than that, but um, it's still a decent chunk, and it'll happen a lot more than you think. Um, so... Yeah. Um, they don't say you do double damage. They say you get a hope, you get a stress, and extra cool stuff. I'm wondering if the extra cool stuff also means you do more damage. Maybe it won't. Um, but, yeah. But if you do, if you just have two dice, and you don't have any other dice influencing your ability to roll to the same number, then it's fine. There's nothing crazy about this. Uh, it's not too outlandish. And it can actually be a really fun system. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a good idea. Well, now that we've explained the basics of the duality dice, let's uh, lightly skim the character creation process. For a deeper dive into character creation, check out our Daggerheart character creation video where I sit down with Travis Willingham and make Bertrand Bell, which is linked. But for the might have to watch that later. This video will give you a brief overview. Our character classes are Bard, Druid, Guardian, Ranger, Rogue, Seraph, Sorcerer, Warrior, and Wizard. Every class has one or more class features, which are spells and abilities that are unique to each class. Like the rogue, for example, has a thing called cloak, which allows them to move into a space where no enemies can see them and be effectively invisible as long as they don't move or attack. Each class also consists of the meeting of two domains, which are like symbolic themes. Through these two domains, you pick and choose what abilities you want for your character by taking domain cards at character creation and every time you level up. These domains are Arcana, the domain of innate or instinctual magic, Blade, the domain of weapon mastery, Bone, the domain of swiftness and tactical mastery. Codex, the domain of intensive magical study. Grace, the domain of charisma and enchantment. Midnight, the domain of shadow and secrecy. Sage, the domain of the natural world. Splendor, the domain of life and death. And Valor, the domain of protection. Uh, just a little, like, comment. Uh, I'm interested in why they decided to say bone was about tactical mastery like why was why isn't it just like a skull and crossbones or a skull because it looks like a weapon and i feel like some people might be a little confused about oh i want to be weapon guy well that looks like a weapon so i don't know if that's not a big deal or if i don't i don't, I don't know it, uh So, for example, the bard calls upon the charm and magnetism of the Grace Domain, along with the lore and magic of the Codex Domain. And if you want to cast a spell from a domain card you have, typically you'll have a spell cast roll. This works just like an action roll, but uses your spell cast trait that you can find on your subclass foundation card. Okay, uh, let's take a look at this. Um, when you play a relaxing song during a moment of calm, you and any close allies heal one hit point. When you play an epic song during battle, make a target temporarily vulnerable. When you play a heartbreaking song at any time, you and any close allies take a hope. Okay, so this is what they were talking about when they were trying to marry roleplay with mechanics. So what essentially they're doing is trying to say, hey, if you roleplay your class, you will get some sort of mechanical benefit. You or someone else and you know uh you will be rewarded you and your friends will be rewarded with a mechanical benefit i think that's great um i think it's really good that they're very specific 
with how the role play stuff works? Well, specific and vague. Uh, specific in the idea that, hey, play a song, but vague in the idea that, like, well, I mean, during battle, or, like, it's a relaxing song. So it leaves it up to interpretation. It gives you an inspiring, like, idea, and it encourages you to seek out these moments. Like, oh, it's a moment of calm. Now I should sing. Or it's a battle. I should sing you know, so that I get this thing or my friend gets this thing. That's really, 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 really good. Um, I really like this, actually. Um, this this is fantastic. I hope they um, do their best to have stuff, more stuff like this for each class. Um, you know, like... Um, because there's some board games that will have some sort of, some tiny, uh, like, little tiny bits of roleplay or in them, even though the game isn't even about roleplay. So, um, uh, there's a card game that, that is, it's a Dungeons and Dragons licensed card game. It's really, really simple and small. But basically, on one of the cards, like, if you play Barbarian... There's a card that you can, I, I, at least if I remember correctly, um, I, there's like druid cards that do this, and there's barbarian. I believe there's barbarian cards like this. But like for instance, there's a barbarian card where you like scream. Like the the game says, hey, if you scream or do a battle cry, you get this thing, you know. And like any player is gonna do that. They're gonna be like, yeah, sure, I'll scream to do that. Or they play a druid card and like, yeah, I'll make a the you know i'll make an animal noise and get something in return you know which is really good um that's that's kind of what i think about when i look at this which is great um super great idea i hope they do more stuff like this um and i'm glad that they're trying to be vague with a moment of calm during battle, because battle could be like a fight to the death, it could be a duel, it could be a brawl, like like a like a tavern brawl or something like that. Um, just any time that there is a conflict. Hell, I bet I bet some GMs might say a battle could be like a chess match, a battle of wits, you know. So I really hope that they stay vague with this, because this will um, this will leave it up for interpretation, and the player can be like, "Ooh, this is my time." Um, this sounds like a battle. This sounds like a moment of calm. It's time for me to become involved narratively. And I get rewarded with a mechanical benefit. This is like infinitely better than inspiration. You know? Infinitely better than inspiration. Um, I also hope that this isn't a requirement. You know? It's great to incentivize players to roleplay... But I really, 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 really hope that those people who are uncomfortable role-playing won't get punished too much or, you know, there won't be too much left on the table if they don't participate. You know, obviously you want to incentivize this. This is an incentivizing tool. You don't want it to be a punishment by not doing it. So, uh, but so far this is great. Really good stuff. In Daggerheart, your base character traits are agility for things like sprinting, leaping, and maneuvering, strength for things like lifting, smashing, or grappling, finesse, which is used for like hiding, tinkering, or fine motor control, instinct, which is for like navigating, perceiving, and sensing, presence for charming, deceiving, and performing, and knowledge for analyzing, recalling, and comprehending. You begin with a standard array of traits, which you can include. Mm. Okay, so this is their standard array. So what I was talking about earlier is because they they use 2d12 and because the maximum dice roll, even though it's difficult, it is possible. And if it's possible, it will happen. Um, their maximum roll is 24, which means they've decided to go down with modifiers. They decided to reduce player power and increase dice power um, while also making the dice less random. So... Interesting direction, not my favorite, 
Um, I totally understand the idea of modifiers being more powerful. Um, like, so in this system, because you get less of them, modifiers are more valuable. They're not necessarily more powerful, though. Uh, but they've decided to go with plus one, plus ones, and then, like, maybe a plus two, and then a minus one. I like the minus one. I think that's great. I think there should be weaknesses. I think there should be things that your character are not is not good at that another party member is good at. Um, so that's good. I'm glad that there's a negative one in there at in their standard array. They have a plus two, two ones, two zeros, and a negative one. That that sounds like a great spread. Um, there's six uh, ability scores, and so they basically said you should be really good at one, and you should be good at two. And the other ones are whatever. So you're good at half of them and the other half you're not good at. Which is okay. That's fine. Also, another thing that is that I just thought of that's kind of good in this system is if you have someone who's like a paladin, a, 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 a mad class, which means multiple attribute dependent class, um, this system is more favorable, favorable to them. Or at least in my head it is. Like... Obviously, I haven't, I haven't looked at anything else. But if the modifiers are lower, that means that you don't need a higher a high, a high mod to be successful. And if you want to have a more of a spread of attributes, then that's actually not that bad of a thing. It, it depends on how high these modifiers can go. But if they're low, like let's say like a 3 is the highest you can get or 4 is the highest you can get... Um, like at all and there's like no proficiency modifier right so the highest that any modifier that you could get to any of these roles would be a four like a three or a four then having be a character that's like i'm really good at strength instinct and knowledge then it's like that's more viable which is a good thing um uh but looking at this they don't have constitution so they don't have anything about being having a lot of vigor or health. They have agility, strength, finesse, instinct, presence, knowledge. So they basically have dexterity, strength, dexterity again, wisdom, charisma, and then intelligence. Um, I don't hate it. Uh, I'm wondering why they didn't just say that agility and finesse were just the same thing and they j and they could have gone with just five attributes or, or abilities um i'm curious to see why they did that like um that's what my immediate thought is but i don't know maybe maybe there's more to agility and finesse to where they believed they should have been split up um uh we'll have to see Now let's talk about hit points and stress. Oh, he uh, right there at the tail end that he said, he said that you can increase when you level up. So you will get attribute or ability score improvements. That's good to know. In first edition Dungeons & Dragons, there was no such thing. You increased your abilities by getting magic items. That was the game. The game was about getting loot. So um, curious to see how this does things. Daggerheart, a character's overall health is represented by a number of hit points, which you'll find on your character sheet in the form of several blank boxes. When you're faced with incoming damage, you will fill in or mark a certain number of these hit points based on your character's damage. Okay, so they're going like way, 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 way back in time with hit points. They're going with literal hit, like points, points, um, not like uh, a numerical value of, I have seven I have 70 hit points. They're going with, like, literally hit points. And I'm assuming that this is as many as you get. I'm assuming you don't get any more. There's no constitution score. So I assume this is what you get. There's thresholds. So if you take minor damage, you mark one hit point. For major damage, you mark two hit points. And for severe damage, you mark three hit points. Okay. This is actually good. This is actually really good. Um, so how they, they don't have a constitution score, so how they supplement, um, you having more health or durability is by increasing the minor, the major, and the severe. Um, 
And so that effectively does the same thing while still making it... Um, this is actually such a good idea uh, from a game master perspective because if you're creating an encounter and you're like, ooh, I want this to be easy, and you're like, okay, cool, I'll just have the average damage be the minor thing, and then I want to have it be like a medium or hard encounter, then it's like, all right, cool, the average damage of the monsters should be major. And then if you want like, I want an ancient dragon... I want them to be, like, scared, or, like, they shouldn't be here, or, like, you want to create a scenario where, like, guys, you will maybe die, then severe. Or if you want to avoid that, then you're, like, now you have these numbers on their character sheets that, like, okay, cool, I have to avoid this. I have to avoid making a encounter where this is the average damage, um, or this is the maximum damage. Like, you might say that, like, okay, the maximum damage that a monster should do should be less than severe. You know, and then you can kind of, this is great for GM because it kind of like create, it gives you the tools necessary to kind of create a encounter of a certain difficulty up to you and the player's preference. And what's also good about this is that I am assuming that each player will have a different set of minor, major, and severe, which means you can cross-reference those and you can create a really balanced encounter by saying, oh, this character has a two and minor and this character has a four and minor. So that means that it should be three or, you know, two or three or something like that, or, you know, like three to four. Um, so yeah, the, this is really good. I like this a lot. Whenever you take damage, you simply compare that damage amount to your character's damage threshold and mark your hit points accordingly. For example, if a rogue at level one has 15 damage coming at them, uh, that would be just over their severe damage threshold. So they would mark three dots. If you ever take damage below your minor damage threshold, you take a stress instead of damage. Now, stress is also a resource that your character can endure to carry out certain uncanny feats or class abilities. But you gotta be careful. Okay, we have another resource. So we have hope and stress. <laughs> if you should ever need to mark a stress, but you can't because they're all marked, you mark a hit point instead. Okay. So you want to spend stress? But I'm assuming it's not something that you can spend something on that's not like hope. Interesting. Evasion represents your ability to avoid being hit by an attack. So when the GM makes an attack roll against a player, they roll 1d20. They add any modifiers and see if the result meets or beats this number. Uh, that's weird. That's really weird. So if you roll, so normally you're supposed to roll 2d12 because you because of hope and fear and rolling doubles for critical successes, right? That seems, and, and they said that the, it was like the bread and butter roll. But now when you're evading, you're rolling a d20? That seems very weird. That seems very weird. Not only because mathematically it's different, you know, like, is the GM rolling 2d12 against your d20? Is the GM rolling a d20 against your d20? Why are we even using d20s? Why are we even using 2d12s? Why don't we just... This feels very inconsistent and awkward. And it, it, it leads to... It can lead to confusion from the players. It's like, they'll accidentally roll 2d12 because they're used to rolling 2d12, you know? And then they get a result that's higher or on average, you know, closer to the average than would be desired, you know. And also, like, the d20 is a lot more random, and so your ability to evade is a lot more random. And also, if you're adding modifiers to this thing, which, by the way, we've, in, we've established is are lower, these modifiers are lower, which makes rolling on the d20 feel even worse. Uh... I this is probably the worst part about this game so far. Um, maybe they'll explain why. Maybe they won't. Um, I'm sure there's a reason why this is the case. There has to be a very deliberate reason why they would do something like this. But so far, I don't understand what that would be. Um, anyways. The attack hits a player. The player can choose to mark armor slots to reduce the incoming damage by their armor slot. For example, let's go back to our level one rogue that has 15 damage coming at them. 
if they have an armor score of three, like if they have leather armor, mm -hmm. uh, they can choose to mark one of their armor slots and reduce that damage to 12, downgrading that severe damage into just major damage. This means they mark two hit points instead of three. They can always choose to mark more than one armor slot if they need to reduce the damage by more as well. And you can, of course, get those armor slots back, but you have to do it by repairing your armor during the round. We'll cover that in just a little bit. Okay, so repairing armor. Is that going to be actions? Do you have to perform checks to do that? Do you have to spend money? Um, how frequently can you do it? How frequently are you going to be able to do that? Because, like, if you can only do that... I assume you should be able to do it as a rest action. So this is good because it, it, it's it's a... Again, it's another resource. I don't, I'm not sure I like how many resources are going into this. But if you wanted to wanted to keep it simple. I don't hate the idea. Uh, I kind of like it. Um, it's a really good, I will say, it's a very good idea for accomplishing the durability of armor in a pen and paper setting. Durability is super easy to do in a video game. You can kind of just have the computer do all the math for you if you want to have a more intricate system. Um, but with durability, um, in a tabletop game where you everything the player has to do all the math, um, keeping numbers low is, is best, and I think this is a good idea. I'm curious to know if all armor will have three things, or if like you will be able to have like heavy armor that has like four. Um, if it's always three and the only thing that changes is the number. Um, it's okay. I don't, I don't hate it. it. It's not wrong. Um, it's definitely not wrong. Uh, it's just, it'll just, uh, it'll be interesting. This is a really good idea because what it does is it forces you, if, if you can repair your armor during a rest, then it means that the player characters want to take rests. Not necessarily long rests, um, but, you know, it could incentivize to take short rests, which I'm a huge fan of. If that's not the direction they're going for, then that's fine. Um, I am concerned, though, because with how many hit points you have and how f in f you know how little you can use armor, um, I'm wondering how lethal or short encounters will end up being. Will there only be like a couple turns? Um, you know, like a couple rounds, like two, three rounds, because, you know, you do severe damage. And maybe that's why there aren't, they didn't say doing double damage. They haven't said that you can deal double damage yet. Maybe that's why, is because that's insane and super scary um, with based on how many hit points you have and how armor works. Um, I, I like it, but... It really depends. It, it seems very small, which isn't a bad thing, but it, it, it makes me think like, okay, I my immediate thought is combat encounters are short, and they are also very deadly. You know, like, your character has the potential to die in two attacks. I assume that means that um, characters don't perform very many attacks, right? So they'll only have, like, one action, one attack. Boom, he's severe. Boom, he's at half health, you know? I assume monsters work in the same way. It'd be very weird if it didn't. And maybe some monsters only have one hit point, and it's like, you just have to hit them. Maybe. I don't know. Um, this is something that needs a lot more context to be able to evaluate further. But I, I, I do like it. Um... Very, very interesting. It makes healing a lot more simple. It, makes ma it, it reduces how much math there is. Way less bookkeeping, I think. So, yeah, overall, I think I think it's good. I think it's in the right direction. I'm just concerned at how deadly certain encounters might end up being. And how... And I personally, as a player, don't like how frequently you just... Combat encounter, rest. Combat encounter, rest. Like, and, and those rests being, like, long rests, like... Let's do one fight, and let's go to sleep. You know, I like dungeon crawls, and me personally, I like dungeon crawls. Maybe they're not going for something like that, um, but 
Mm, we'll see. Now let's go ahead and talk about Game Master stuff. So setting appropriate difficulty values for your players is a time-honored tradition for many Game Masters. And when it comes to Daggerheart, a general good rubric to follow when setting difficulty values is a range of 5 being very easy, like extremely easy, up to 15 being your standard average difficulty, all the way up to 30 and more being nearly impossible. You should also be aware of the circumstances surrounding action rolls because they may grant advantage or disadvantage. For example, maybe you're attempting to lift a broken carriage out of a muddy ditch in the pouring rain, and if that's the case, the GM may impose disadvantage on the strength roll to do that. This situational modifier is represented by including one d6 with the action roll. With advantage, you add the sum of the d6 to the roll. If you have disadvantage, you subtract the value from the roll. Okay. So, this doesn't do what my game does. My game, when you have advantage, you have another... So, your normal roll has 2d10, and when you have advantage, you have a third d10, and you roll those three together, and you pick the two highest. That's how my advantage works, which is why rolling doubles is a lot more frequent in my game. Um, this game says you roll a d6, which is interesting because a d6 is half of a d12, you know? Um... That, so basically it's saying, hey, your potential is higher by a d6 if you have advantage, and it's lower by a d6 if you have disadvantage. Which is also interesting because they just said that the, uh, the nearly impossible um, difficulty score is a 30. Well, what's 2d4, or 2d12 plus 1d6? A maximum result of 30 without modifiers. It's, that's very, 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 very unlikely but um it's within the realms of possibility so it's interesting um i kind of like that advantage gives you a bonus like you get more of a result i am concerned because your 2d12 is already kind of high that whether or not this is like the best idea i definitely think it's better than what i would than my system and it, uh, because they use 2d12s, I wouldn't use what I do. Um, they use... And, and the addition of a d6 when in conjunction with using d12s I think feels very natural. D6s are super fun. Most people have d6s. Um, and the fact that you're subtracting a roll or adding a roll is interesting. There's a lot of dice. There's a lot of chance in this game. Less uh, player power. Um, okay. Always remember that at any time a player can give another player advantage on an action roll by spending one hope and describing how they're aiding their ally. Well, you can get okay. So every time you roll, you have a ch you are either going to get a hope or the GM is going to get a fear. And if you get a, a hope, you could just give it just get advantage that seems crazy let's talk a little bit about how combat works combat kind of weird that they went that they're talking about combat now i feel like they should have been talking about it before but anyways that and daggerheart is designed to be a free-flowing narrative experience with minimal stop downs and a multitude of possibilities for theater of the mind and map-based conflict when you want to make an attack, you'll first ask the GM if it's in range of your weapon. So melee range means that you're within touching distance of the target. Very close is anywhere from like five. Yeah, I had a feeling that they would do something like this. Um, so they're not doing numeric numerical values of distance because they want to support theater of the mind. So they're supporting theater of the mind first, and then if you want to use a battle map, congratulations, you're on a battle map. Um, yeah, this is my immediate thought of creating something like this is, are you close? Are you far? Very vague descriptions of, of distance. Um, I personally don't like this approach. I personally don't like games that are theater of the mind. I, it's not that you can't do it or that you shouldn't or that they can't be fun. I personally don't like it because it's kind of messy in terms of, like, design. 
um, it can be good for theater of the mind because you can have, you can really incentivize like, or, or, or you can really uh, evoke the power of a monster by saying, yeah, they were very far, but they're so fast that they get into melee range of you or something like that. Like you can do that without the requirements of a stat block, um, which I think is cool. Um, very close, short side of a card. Uh, let's let's continue. Ten feet away, or the shortest length of a game card when measured on a map. Oh, they're measuring it with cards. Hmm, I don't hate it. I assume that means that you have to play with these cards because they showed cards with with like the classes on them and with like text on them. So maybe maybe the game's gonna come with cards or maybe the game will just have card descriptions and then it's like, I hope you have a pack of cards and dice. Um, uh, I don't dislike it. Close is between 10 and 30 feet. A standard pencil. Okay. Uh, every, Every pencil is going to be different. I mean, I feel like, I feel like the the crunchy group is going to be like, this is the pencil, this is the pencil, that we've all agreed upon that this is the the distance of close. Or about the length of a standard pen or pencil. Far is between. <laughs> People are going to get like unsharpened pencils to play this game. Thirty and a hundred feet, or the length of a standard piece of paper. And very far is between 100 and 300 feet or anything beyond the length of a piece of paper that's within the scene. If it is in range, make an act. I mean, this is fine because it means that you don't actually need a grid. You don't need a grid to play. Or maybe you do. I wonder how they're going to do movement. But this is, this is basically saying, like, let's have... Uh, let's get some Monopoly pieces out and put them on the table, and those will represent our characters and the monsters, and we can just decide how close they are based on random objects in our house. Um, I don't dislike it. Um, but I... It doesn't make me want to play it. Action roll and add any relevant modifier meets or beats that creature's individual difficulty score, it hits. Now simply roll your damage dice and add their values together. The monster's difficulty score. So monsters don't have defenses, they don't have saving throws. A monster is scaled based on their difficulty. I really like that. Um, I hope it's just one number, but hmm, we'll see. Creatures also have minor, major, and severe damage thresholds, just like player characters, Yeah. Uh, and a variable amount of hit points and stress. But they don't have armor or evasion scores like players. No armor, no evasion. And they have varying amounts of hit points and stress. So they can have stress too, which assumes that they can also spend stress on things. And they have varying amounts of hit points, like I thought that they might. Um, okay. Now for you GMs out there, if you're rolling to see if a creature hits a player character, you simply roll a d20, add the relevant modifiers in that monster sheet, and see if it hits that player's evasion score. If it hits, roll for damage, and the player determines if they'll spend armor. Okay, so d20, it's d20s against d20s. It seems so weird. The slots to reduce it, or how many hit points they have to mark thereafter. Now, if your players are entering into a combat that will last for more than one or two turns, your GM may place an action tracker on the table. When an action tracker is out, players add a token to it whenever they make an action roll. Players will continue to make action rolls in combat until they fail and or roll with fear, which then allows the focus to shift to the GM to make what's called a GM move. When player characters make an action roll, they place a character token on the action tracker. Seems very board gamey. When the GM move, makes a move, they may choose to spend any number of the, of the tokens currently on the action tracker. For each token they spend, they can activate an adversary on the battlefield to take an action. This could be casting a spell, making an attack, ending a temporary condition. Now, a GM move is literally just the GM taking a turn. <laughs> so after a player rolls with fear and or fails an attack roll, 
The GM then has the opportunity to spend any number of action tokens from the tracker and activate that many enemy combatants. Okay. So all those turns the players took in succession now turn into resources for you. <laughs> that's actually okay, that's actually kind of big brain. That's actually kind of really good. So what this does is say that the players can perform actions and until they fail or they roll high with fear which, by the way, rolling high with fear is like a 50% chance. Although I assume because of how many uh, tokens that they displayed that that is, that it's more often that, like, there will be quite a few action tokens. And anything that the players do, the GM can deliver equally. So that's a balancing thing, and I like that a lot. I'm very confused on how many actions each player can take. Um, uh, it, it's, it's interesting, um, but I'm still a little confused about it. After the GM turn is resolved, play then passes back to the players. Anytime, GMs can also spend two action tokens to gain one fear token. Remember those? How every time your player characters roll a fear, the GM collects a fear token? Well, here's where they factor in. At any point during combat, a GM can spend two of the fear tokens accrued during a session to make a GM move without needing the players to roll a failure or roll fear. Additionally, GMs can spend fear tokens to activate special abilities of adversaries or generate action tokens for themselves or make particularly big and dramatic GM moves. If things go really bad in or out of combat, character death in Daggerheart is a real possibility. But the system offers players three options to choose from when the character marks their final. The first option is called Blaze of Glory. This option lets your character, you guessed it, die in a glorious and heroic fashion, where they take one final action that will be an automatic critical success before passing into the great beyond. Then there's the ever popular avoid death and face the consequences, where your character drops unconscious and cannot take any actions until they get at least one hit point back. When this happens, you roll your fear die, and if it's equal to or under your level, you gain a scar, which means you permanently cross out one of your hope slots. And finally, there's Risk It All, our personal favorite, I believe, <laughs> which leaves it all up to chance. You roll your duality dice. If your hope die is higher, you stay on your feet and clear an amount of hit points and or stress equal to the value you roll on your hope die. But if your fear die is higher, you immediately cross through the veil of death. Now, if the duality dice are tied, which once again is a critical success in Daggerheart, you don't just stay on your feet, you also clear all of your hit points and stress, renewed and ready to go right back into it. Now that we've covered all the stuff you can do in combat. I, I like I like the variety of options. That's really good for character play. It gives character agency when they fall to zero. They get, um, because something that uh, death saves doesn't do is, is make it so that the player character who is making death saving throws gets to do anything or participate in the game. So when a player goes down, they get to say like, well, I get to choose. Um, I'm concerned about risk at all. I feel like it'll feel, it'll feel really good if you succeed or critically succeed, but failing will just be like, man, uh, you know, but I mean, it seems good. It seems like it'd be fun. Um, I'm still concerned on like how little hit points there are. Let's touch on some I, I would, I would probably have more hit points personally, but I don't know. I haven't been the one playtesting this, so. The stuff you can do during your downtime. If you take a short rest in Daggerheart, you can spend about an hour doing two of the following options. You can tend to your wounds or another player's wounds, clearing 1d4 hit points. You can blow off some steam and clear 1d4 of your stress. You can spend time mending your armor or another person's armor and clear two marked armor slots. Or you can simply spend the time preparing yourself for the path ahead and gain a home. If you're able to make camp and relax for a few hours, you can take a long rest and choose two of the following. Clear all marked hit points, clear all marked stress, Fully mend your armor, clearing all marked armor slots, or do this on an ally. You can prepare and gain one hope, or you can choose to prepare with one or more members of your party and instead take two hope each. 
Lastly, you can work on a project. It takes a substantial amount of time, like deciphering an ancient codex or crafting a new weapon. The GM will assign this project a countdown, and each time you work on this project, you tick down that countdown until the project is complete. Now, when you're at level five or above, during a long or short rest, you can swap domain cards in your loadout with any domain cards in your vault. This is useful because you can only have five domain cards in your loadout at a time, but you really don't have to worry about that until the higher levels anyway. I think that's it. I think that's all. I think that. Uh, the rest stuff, really good. I like it a lot. Um, yeah, no notes on that. It's looks looks really good looks robust um you're always getting something and you get to choose what you get and you even have some choice as to help your friends um yeah see it looks looks really good <laughs> uh, that wraps up our uh, our quick and dirty overview of the Dagger Heart rule set as it currently sits. Uh, I know it's a lot up front, like any game system is, but uh, we're excited for you guys to get an opportunity to dive in, play it out for yourself, and kind of give us your feedback on how you feel about it. Yeah, we're really excited because the game is in a state where we can actually take the feedback that you're giving us and implement it across the game. We're opening the, the beta specifically so that we can work together with you on this. And I'm just really excited to see people like playing this game out in the wild after working on it for so oh, yeah. long together. Yeah, so. If you want to learn more about this and even join the open beta play test that we have now, mm -hmm. please go check out daggerheart.com, sign up, check it out, print it out, play it with your friends, and uh, help us make this with you. Not just for you, but with you. So thank you so much for joining us, yeah. and uh, roll some dice and have fun. Okay, um, yeah. Overall, it looks really good. Um, I have high hopes. I was I was very curious as to what they had been cooking up. I'll definitely take a look at um, their book if they have it available. I assume they do because it's an open beta. They want people to read it and test it. So I'll probably take a look at that later. But honestly, there's a lot of good here. There's a lot of good stuff here. Um, it looks super simple. It looks super easy to get into. I hope that the classes and those card things aren't too com complex because the rest of the game wants to be very, very simple, very low math. Um, the, only, the only real concern that I have is why... Why the difference between the duality die and the d20? Like, are you always rolling the duality die? Like, are you only using d20 in combat? Like, I assume, like, they don't want more fear and more hope going during in combat. And so I think what they're trying to do is basically, at least the, this is my thought process, right? I, my first, imp my impressions on it. I haven't read, I would have to rule, read the rule book. To kind of understand and know why but i assume what's going on is you have your duality dice which is your role play dice you do this when you're exploring when you're you know role playing as your character when you're doing cool exploration stuff um story narrative stuff and you collect those hope and you collect those fear over time and then when a conflict arises that's when you can't, you don't use your roleplay dice anymore because you don't want to, you know, it's time for you to spend the hope and the, and the fear, and you don't want to accumulate more outside of the combat mechanics that they have. And then you roll the d20s because it's like, it's not duality dice. Um, but I'm concerned about that because you're using the 2d12 and the modifiers are lower because you're rolling 2d12 rather than a d20 and you have a higher you have a higher average roll with 2d12 you have a higher max roll with 2d12 and so your modifiers are reflecting that the lower modifiers reflect that the difficulty scores reflect that but then you have the d20 and i assume you're using the same modifiers so yeah i don't know I don't really like it. I think they should just use 2d12. Keep it simple. Keep it streamlined. Keep it the same. Consistent. And just say, during combat, when you roll 2d12, 
you don't do this. Maybe that was too confusing in their playtesting. Um, maybe they didn't like it. I don't know. That's the only thing that I don't like about this so far. Everything else seems very sound, seems very balanced. And when I mean by balanced, I don't mean like fair. I mean balanced in terms of like, you spend this, you get this, this happens, that happens. There's like, um, there's a lot of good here. It's balanced because it seems like, um, everything seems like fair. You can use your armor thing up to three times. You have only six hit points and it, you know, you can take one, two or three damage thresholds. It's like, it's balanced in a way that it feels like all the numbers are, seem very tight knitted and, and, uh, and good. Um, but that's just like an impression, right? I, I haven't played it, so I don't know how it feels, how it, it can, something can look balanced and feel not balanced. Um, I've learned that the hard way. Uh, but yeah, overall it looks really good. I'll definitely check it out. Um, you guys should all check it out. Um, do them a favor, play test the game, make it, make the game better as best as it can be. And it can only, they can only do that with your help. So yeah, go ahead and check it out. But, uh, yeah, that's going to be it for me. Uh, if you like this kind of content or you want to see more, uh, like and comment, um, if this video does good enough, I might even, uh, look at the, the book, do a video on that. That could be cool. Um, yeah. Thanks for watching. See ya.